Good evening, everyone. My name is Harry Helling. I'm the executive director here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps, um, UC San Diego, and I want to welcome you to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Speaker Series. This evening, we are hosting a panel of experts who will be presenting on a recent report entitled Collaborative Planning for Climate Resilience, an Integrated Science-Based Framework for the San Diego Region. Our speakers will discuss the critical need for interdisciplinary approaches to the challenges facing our region and the interagency approach utilized by the San Diego Association of Governments, SANDAG, to develop San Diego's new regional plan. We are fortunate to have the three lead authors of the report with us this evening, as well as the Deputy Executive Director of SANDAG. Joining us from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, we have Dr. Julie Kalansky, the manager for the Center for California Nevada Applications Program. Julie has years of experience in the collection and analysis of data related to a wide range of environmental, weather, and climate related topics and helps stakeholders apply such information to their decision making. Her research is focused on water resources, extreme weather events, and climate projections. Joining us on behalf of the American Planning Association Regional and Intergovernmental Planning Division is Robert Leiter, an urban and environmental planner and former director of planning and land use for SANDAG. Also joining us on behalf of the American Planning Association Regional and Intergovernmental Planning Division is writer and consultant Carrie Lowe. Carrie is a retired land use attorney and mediator with 45 years of experience representing land developers, builders, public agencies, Native American tribes, and nonprofit organizations. And finally, to conclude the panel presentations, we're honored to welcome Colleen Clementson, Deputy Executive Director for SANDAG. Colleen is the former Director of Regional Planning for SANDAG and has more than 20 years of experience in public sector land use and transportation planning in the San Diego region. Please join me in welcoming our speakers for tonight's presentation, Planning for Climate Resilience in San Diego. Oh, good evening, and thank you all for joining us here this evening. Uh, we're very happy to be uh, presenting to you our report on collaborative planning for climate resilience. Uh, as um, you just heard, uh, Julie, Bob, and I were the authors of this report, but Colleen played an important role as well as uh, one of the um, uh, reviewers that, uh, whose input was instrumental uh, in finalizing this report. In fact, we had, in addition to the uh, three of us who were the primary authors, we had nine contributing authors, including three other climate scientists from Scripps, as well as 25 uh, outside reviewers who came from uh, a plethora of other public agencies and academic institutions and organizations. So uh, we're, we're very pleased with the report. We've gotten good feedback on it from uh, many sources. What's important uh, at the outset to understand is that um, those of you, and probably most of you who have been following climate science for in recent years, know that there have been a lot of studies done uh, and there's many recommendations made with regard to how to respond to climate change, how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and uh, what to do about those uh, impacts. We began with the assumption that at this stage, many of the impacts of climate change are already with us and are probably irreversible. Uh, and that the, the impacts are gonna to continue to uh, worsen for an indefinite time into the future, uh, almost regardless of how much reduction we're able to accomplish in greenhouse gas emissions. So we focused on um, how to adapt to those impacts. Uh, and that adaptation can't happen inside each city or county separately. It, at the very least, it needs to be addressed on a regional basis. Uh, and that's why we looked at this on a regional scale. So our report talks about resilience, and, and resilience really has two components to it. Uh, so let me um, turn to this illustration. 
that uh, shows you there's mitigation and there's adaptation. So mitigation is generally considered to be uh, whatever we can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the first place, whereas adaptation is concerned more with how we respond to the impacts that we're feeling or can expect to feel going forward in the future. Together, those uh, constitute resilience. And resilience refers really to the ability of both uh, built and natural systems to, I'll say, bounce back from impacts like those that climate change is inflicting on us and is going to continue to do so. So let's look at the San Diego region for a moment. It's a complicated region. We have not only the county of San Diego itself, but within it, we have 18 separate municipalities. And here's something that will surprise many of you. We also have 18 separate tribal nations. San Diego County has the largest number of Native American tribes of any county in the United States. Not necessarily the largest reservations, but the largest number of them. And every one of them is a separate governmental entity as well. Then on top of that, we have military and naval facilities. We have a huge number of special districts, water districts, and various other kinds of specialized local districts. Every one of those is going to have to respond in some way to the impacts of climate change on its operational systems. And they're beginning to do that, thankfully. Uh, not only are cities and the county and, and the military and so on doing that, Native American tribes are as well. Uh, I'm working with one right now that's uh, looking very closely at how they can uh, adapt their reservation to the very substantial impacts that they're feeling. And frankly, that's something that's true of tribal reservations throughout the county because so many of them are in locations where they're very subject to uh, wildfire, heat, flood, so on, all the, the classic impacts uh, of, uh, of climate change. So we based our report on a, a handful of fundamental framework principles. We wanted to understand the interconnections among the different impacts and how they were impacting these different jurisdictions uh, in our region. We wanted to especially understand the en environmental impacts on what we call environmental justice communities, which tend to be lower income communities, communities of color, uh, tribal reservations, uh, other communities that for various historical reasons are especially sensitive to climate change impacts. And then we wanted to identify what kind of plans are already required to be uh, prepared and carried out by all of these different entities uh, and what we could do to facilitate their ability to plan and implement. So here you have a, a list, a brief list, of uh, what I'll call key guidance documents. These are documents prepared mainly by state government, but also by regional agencies like SANDAG uh, to assist local government entities and others uh, in doing the kind of planning that they need in order to effectively adapt to climate change impacts. Now, you can, at your leisure, look at any or all of these reports. They're all public documents. They're all available online at no cost. So uh, I encourage you to, uh, to take a look at some of them. You'll learn a great deal more about climate change impacts and especially uh, about adaptation to those impacts. But I'm going to focus just very briefly on two of those, uh, of those guidance documents. The first one is the California Adaptation Planning Guide. This is a document prepared two years ago by uh, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Uh, is a terrific guide for local governments to use in uh, creating their own plans to respond to climate change and uh, devise uh, approaches to adaptation. 
Uh, it uh, identifies a number of sectors that need to be addressed individually and collectively uh, and uh, provides examples of actions that can be taken uh, in each of those sectors. So if you look here, you'll see that um, there's quite a variety of sectors that it looks at, everything from public health uh, to agriculture uh, to water and so on. And for every one of those, uh, there are recommendations made and guidance given as to how to address those impacts. Then the other document uh, I want to uh, highlight is the California General Plan Guidelines that are uh, updated regularly by the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Uh, this is the document that local cities and counties use as their roadmap to how to uh, prepare and regularly update their local general plans, which uh, consume not only the, the overall land use planning and, uh, of that jurisdiction, but uh, more specialized community plans, zoning, and other development regulations, and so on. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, the general plans are what are often referred to in uh, the land use field as the, 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 the constitution of land use planning and because it governs everything else that's done within a given jurisdiction when it comes to land use and environmental planning. Within that, there are two things to take particular note of. One is the safety element, which is one of the, the mandatory elements of a general plan. Uh, and that's typically where one would find uh, policies and programs relating to climate adaptation. The other is the environmental justice element, which is now a required element as of a couple of years ago. It didn't, wasn't required, didn't exist before that. Um, and it does exactly what its title suggests. It focuses on how to bring uh, the, the requisite level of environmental justice to those communities that uh, need special attention. So with that, I'm going to pause and I'm going to turn the program over to Julie Kolansky, who is going to talk to you about the scientific basis for our report and the recommendations in it. Thanks, Carrie. What you see up here is a diagram of the California Fourth Climate Change Assessment. We are very fortunate to live in a state that really pushes forward climate uh, research for, our, for California. And this time it was relatively unique. And what you see in the middle there are nine regional reports and three topical reports. And so this is something where you could actually dive into the climate change impacts at a regional level. And I was very fortunate to be able to co-lead this with a colleague here at Scripps and bring together all the really great researcher and research that's going on in the San Diego re region and summarize those impacts for San Diego. Um, and then there's also a statewide report as well. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of those climate change impacts that we're expected to see based on projections and also what we've already currently seen um, in the recent history. So one of these that we can all relate to this week is uh, heat waves. And so what this figure is showing is the, the, the difference between the red and blue bars are the type of heat wave. And so what we're feeling right now, how it's still a little sticky and it hasn't cooled off is one of these nighttime accentuated heat waves and those are the blue bars. And the red ones are the daytime that can, the, when it gets really hot. And as you can see, since about 2005, there's really been an uptick in this. And this one goes through 2020, a colleague of mine has created this figure. And at the end of this year, I'm definitely gonna ask her to update it to see what this year looked like compared to the past. Um, and then if you look at the future projections, what you see is, so the top figure is looking at the end of the century in kind of a business as normal, so a higher green, greenhouse gas emission scenario, what the average hottest day of the year would look like um, in the San Diego region. And if you look at the bottom, you just see the difference from the historical. And so on average, our, by the end of the century, the hottest day that we're experiencing is projected to be between two or four degrees hotter than it is now. And what's not depicted here, but the figure on the left does show, is not only are they expected to get more intense, but the frequency of these heat waves are projected to become more common. 
Now, this is one of my favorite figures to show about San Diego. So what this map is showing is how variable year-to-year -year precipitation is throughout the U.S. And if you look at this map, Southern California jumps out at you. And that's because in Southern California, we have the, in the U.S., we have the highest year-to-year -year variability in terms of precipitation, which means some years it's going to be really dry and some years it's going to be really wet. And we don't necessarily know at the beginning of the year if it's going to be wet or dry. Um, and what projections show is that although we already live in this very variable location, that variability is going to increase even more. So the wet years are going to be wetter, the dry years are going to be drier, and knowing that ahead of time is going to be as hard as it is now, probably. Um, and the other thing that we know about precipitation is, so a lot of our large, very large storms come in the form of what are called atmospheric rivers. And you can see that depicted here as this kind of long, skinny corridor. And it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a river in the atmosphere. So it's this corridor or water vapor. And when it intersects with our topography, uh, it produces a lot of precipitation. And so these storms are projected to become even more intense in the future. So our, our big storms are going to get even bigger. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to touch on here is sea level rise. And so what this is showing is it just takes a snapshot kind of from a middle of the range model of sea level, and each dot represents an hour in that year. And any one time you see that red dot on there, what it shows is when the sea level has reached a, the historical maximum, which in La Jolla occurred in 2015. And so this is 2050, and you can see 2075, and then 2099. And those red dots become a lot more frequent as we go in the future. But one thing to note about sea level rise, it's a relatively slow responder. So we have time to think about this adaptation planning. And so this is just one example of how to think about adaptation planning in that there can be steps along the way. You don't have to do everything all at once necessarily. So for example, you know, currently in our beaches, there's beach nourishment, there's berming, and then we already have some existing seawalls. You know, midterm, like they're trying, testing in Cardiff, you have the Cardiff dunes to see how well that works as a resiliency strategy for sea level extremes. Um, while there's still probably likely to be some beach nourishment, and then if you look at that lifeguard station, that's elevated. So some of those structures that are easy to elevate, you could elevate. And then in the long term, you know, there, it, depending on how well these do and sea level, but we can phase it to see you know, where that sea level goes, there can be more drastic measures taken. So the harder things to elevate maybe need to become elevated. Some things may need to be relocated, like the parking lot, for example. And the other thing that we touched on on our report in terms of climate science is this idea of compounding extremes. And so compounding extremes can take two approaches. It's kind of a sequence of extremes where you get extreme after extreme after extreme, which is shown here. Uh, so this is in 2017 where we had a prolonged drought, or sorry, prior to 2017, 2014 to 2016, we had this prolonged drought. And then 2017 was a really, really wet year. Um, and so you had a lot of vegetation growth. And then that summer was extremely dry and we had no fall rains really. And that's when the Thompson fire started because we didn't have those fall rains to kind of su the suppress the fire risk. And then after the Thompson fire was finally, we got some of those rains, we had such high intensity precipitation or rainfall, it caused the Montecito landslide. And so this is the sequ sequence of events that, you know, back to back, is compounding extremes, which makes it harder to come back from. Um, in the report, we highlight some other difference of co-occurring ex extremes. So something that we just experienced were the heat waves and wildfires. So when you get the heat that dries out the landscape, there's higher wildfire risk. Um, another one is coastal flooding. Oftentimes when you have big storms, you have inland and coastal flooding, and that then there's nowhere for the water to go, so it makes the flooding just that much worse. Um, another one we don't often think about, but the reoccurrence of drought and then wildfire that the, um, makes it harder for natural vegetation to come back. And so oftentimes herbaceous or vegetation that's more fire prone will grow, is more opportuni opportunistic and will grow back and so increasing fire risk and so kind of is a cycle. The last thing that I want to highlight is that again, and we talked, Carrie touched on this, is all the different types of organizations that are part of it. But what really 
as a scientist, I appreciate are some of the boundary spanning organizations we have in San Diego. And so these are groups that help connect us as scientists to those that are making the decisions um, and working on this and can help translate some of that information and keep those relationships. And we're very fortunate in San Diego to both have the uh, Climate Collaborative and the Science Climate Alliance. So with that, Bob, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And uh, I want to start by, uh, if, I think you all received a uh, one-page green handout. I just want to explain it to you uh, briefly. Um, this was an idea I had for how, you, how to get you all engaged in climate resilience planning. And the idea is you're going to hear a lot tonight about um, the, the way climate resilience planning is proceeding here in San Diego and how it should be moving forward. Um, and what, what I have here, it's called Five Questions to Ask Your City's Planning Director. Um, and first of all, you need to find out who your city planning director is. Um, and contact them, and based on what you learned tonight, um, and maybe taking a closer look at some of our reports, um, ask them uh, how they feel your city's officials, the mayor, the city council, the department director, the city manager, how well you think they um, understand the impacts of climate change on your city. Um, and uh, it'll be, you'll be interested to know, you know to what extent they've delved into that. And then more specifically, how do you feel, um, do you feel they have a good understanding of the specific impacts of climate change on disadvantaged communities, which we'll talk about a little more. Um, and, um, and also, do they have a good understanding of what the state law requires cities and counties to do with regard to addressing uh, climate impacts? And, um, and how are they going to proceed on that, including how are they going to get the public involved in those discussions? And, um, and then ask them what's the timeline for that effort, and um, ask them if they need help, because sometimes if a city is struggling to keep up with a whole workload, they may be looking for uh, help, and uh, there are folks you can contact um, who could suggest either the use of consultants or other ways to do some of these things. There, there are a few cities that have done a great job already, and they're willing to share their, their information with uh, cities that aren't quite as far along. So, um, and then if they are in the middle of a process for this, um, ask them to put you on their mailing list so that you can become informed on future public meetings, draft reports that they might be preparing for your city, and, and really give you a chance to uh, uh, engage in this planning because it's, it's pretty much brand new and there's no one right way, but I think you'll learn a lot about your city and about climate change if you uh, take us up on our offer. So this is strictly a take home uh, exercise and uh, I think you'll find it interesting and, and you might learn some things about your city um, that you didn't know as well. Um, so with that, I wanna go into um, the next, uh, the second of the three principles that, uh, that Carrie mentioned, and Julie talked about the first one, which is understanding the impacts of climate change on your own region. The second one is prioritizing environmental justice and equity. And we all know that um, federal and state law provide strong legal bases for treating all people fairly and equitably. And this includes communities of color, along with tribal communities and low income communities. And the next few slides uh, give you some examples of um, what we see in our own region in terms of um, the impacts of climate, or the future impacts of climate change on some of these, um, these particular areas. For example, conflicting land uses, as you see in Bar Barrio Logan, and environmental degradation of some of our creeks and urban areas that are, um, that are affecting uh, low-income communities that surround them. Um, uh, flooding is an imp has an impact on a lot of our um, lower income communities uh, that don't have as good an infrastructure as um, newer communities do. And, um, and also lack of, of shade and excess pavement, what are called heat islands. And this is one of the things that really makes um, extreme heat events a lot worse. And so um, these are examples of what you might see in your own city or in the unincorporated area of the county. Um, and they are all important to understand 
And cities and counties are required now to properly address those impacts. Um, and um, I want to come back a little bit to heat as a hazard because we've all been sweating for the last two weeks together. Um, and so, um, and, and I think it's important to, to understand that, um, that heat, uh, extreme heat is in fact a health and safety hazard in the same way as floods and the wildfires are. Um, a lot of people don't, that doesn't register with them, with them but um, if you look at this bar chart, it's a little hard to read, heat by far uh, leads to more fatalities than any other weather-related event in the country. And you can see that's, that's a big deal. And uh, again, we've just seen, seen that in the West in the last uh, couple weeks. Um, and this is another slide, and these are a little hard to read. These were presented a couple weeks ago through our San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative to many of our uh, local governments and folks that are working on this. Um, he does disparity, which is basically to say some of our older neighborhoods where we typically would have lower income uh, households um, have uh, greater heat as a result of heat, heat islands, uh, more impervious surfaces, less tree cover. And so for a lot of reasons, the extreme heat impacts uh, seem to uh, be particularly felt in those areas. And the settings where heat exposure is particularly consequential. Uh, so you all experience this at your home, but you also think about it in terms of its impact on workplaces, schools and daycare centers, senior living facilities, prisons, jails, and correctional facilities, um, outdoor public spaces, and public transit stops. So extreme heat as a hazard is pretty pervasive. and. Um, is important to understand. And these are some findings that came out of a recent study uh, done up at UCLA um, about uh, heat, extreme heat in residential settings. Um, and one of the interesting things I found, there's no state requirement right now for maintaining indoor temperatures at sufficiently cool levels. Um, uh, even though and, and air conditioning is not considered a mandatory provision from landlords to tenants, unlike heating. And, um, and so we're, we're just learning, I think, uh, or it's becoming much clearer that some of our regulations and some of our local government uh, policies uh, need to really take into account the fact that extreme heat events are going to become more common and they're going to have a big impact on our communities. The other thing that we talk about in our report, and Carrie mentioned uh, the California Adaptation Planning Guide, they put a great focus as well on how to deal with uh, environmental justice and equity issues in adaptation planning. And their point is it's not just about procedural equity. In other words, making sure the people that are affected are brought into the planning process, but it's really looking at how can you provide um, adequate uh, uh, support to these communities to address some of the issues that are particularly impacting on them. And uh, that, that's called distributional equity. And then uh, looking at structural issues that might be continuing that make the problem even worse. So um, the California uh, Pla Planning Adaptation Guide does a good job of giving you some guidance on that. Um, the, in addition, as Carrie mentioned, there's now a requirement for every local government to do uh, adopt an environmental justice element in their general plan. Um, and this slide uh, outlines the re when that is required to be done and what it needs to cover. Um, and it's a pretty comprehensive list of issues that your city ought to be addressing in any of the disadvantaged communities that exist within your um, jurisdiction. Um, I think the leader in doing that kind of planning right now is the county of San Diego. They adopted a uh, environmental justice element uh, last August. It did a really good job of identifying the locations in the unincorporated area that have some of these issues and suggesting uh, solutions for how to deal with those. So that's the second principle, which is environmental justice. The third one is um, identifying regional and local plans that require climate impact analysis. And we broke that into two categories. The first category is regional plans. Um, what you can see here, these are all of the regional plans that we identified, all of which are already underway. 
uh, or have already been adopted, but that need to be, the next time they're updated, need to address climate impacts. And uh, Colleen Clemenson's going to talk about San Diego Forward, the regional plan that Sandag just recently updated. Um, but I think one of the other, and you can see these other ones and take a closer look at them um, at your leisure, but um, I think probably the one of the other most important regional plans is what's called the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. And I know that's a mouthful, but it's basically a countywide plan. It's done by the San Diego County Office of Emergency Services. And it the intent of that is to identify all of the different um, natural hazards and man-made hazards that exist within San Diego County and develop strategies for how to deal with those. Everything from wildfires to um, um, earthquakes to extreme heat events. And now the law requires that they specifically look at climate impacts in, uh, in those plans. And the county is currently updating its plan. Uh, they'll be adopting a new one in 2023. So this would be a good chance for you to take a look at what the county is, is doing um, with regard to the whole region. And the local governments will use this uh, report to do their local planning. Um, and um, in terms of local planning, as Carrie mentioned, the safety element of the general plan is considered sort of the home base for a lot of climate adaptation policies and strategies. Um, again, the County of San Diego, I think, is a leader in this region in having adopted the first uh, safety element update that meets the requirements of the state law and deals with climate impacts. And you can see in the illustration, um, is a wildfire um, hazard severity map. And uh, this isn't going to surprise any of you. Uh, everything in red has what's called very high uh, fire severity. Uh, and it, this is a map produced by CAL FIRE. So it's, uh, it's pretty accurate, although it's somewhat outdated. And um, this is a big problem. Uh, and, and it raises a lot of tough policy issues. But the county has addressed it in their updated safety element. The other local jurisdiction that's done a really good job is the city of San Diego. And they adopted last December what's called Climate Resilient San Diego, which is their safety element update. It also incorporates a lot of environmental justice uh, policies and analysis. And again, the thing I like about this particular plan is it's pretty easy to read and pretty logical. It's not written in planneries, which um, most of you have read and really hate. And I apologize on behalf of all the planners. Uh, we do our best, but uh, this is well written and you'll understand it and you'll know what your city is, uh, is doing. So finally, just briefly, I'll um, finish up with what we're calling our proposed planning framework. And um, what we tried to do is organize in sort of a logical manner all of these regional and local plans that, um, that we know our region is going to need to do. And what we did is we identified four focus area categories of infrastructure, natural resources, coastal resources, and public health and safety. And, um, and then we identified two scales, regional scale and local scale. And then we look at environmental justice and equity as sort of the lens in which all of these planning uh, uh, focus areas need to be considered. And then when we uh, take all of those individual plans that I showed you in the previous section, you can see that they fall into these categories fairly neatly. And this framework is starting to, I think, get, uh, get some traction in the region in the planning that's being done. And I think you're gonna see it continue to do so. It's gonna help the planners, it's gonna help the scientists, and it's gonna help the stakeholders to really understand how all this stuff is uh, happening. So uh, the last thing I'll just say in conclusion, um, it just we, in our report, we, we made these findings that we have a much clearer understanding now of the impacts of climate change in our region. We know we need to focus greater attention on the disparate impacts of climate change on disadvantaged communities. Um, we know that climate change was gonna require that we rethink all of our regional and local plans and, um, and fourth, that uh, universities, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector are all key players. The government cannot do this alone. And that's why I have given you this uh, take-home exercise. That's your first, first assignment to, to jump into this. And our last point is there's no time to waste. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colleen. So thank you for that, Bob. And I think the, probably the no time to waste is really critical. And um, I work for SANDAG. And for those of you who are not aware, SANDAG is where the San Diego Association of Governments. We're a governmental agency. And we're run by a board of directors. And the board of directors are representatives from each of the 18 cities and the county of San Diego. So it's a mayor or a council member from a city and then a representative from the county board of supervisors. And what our primary charge is, is to do transportation planning and projects and implement those projects. So an example of a Sandag project is the extension of the light rail trolley that has gone from Old Town up here to UC San Diego. So we had planned that, it had been in our previous plans, we design it, engineer it, build it, and then we turn it over to the transit agency, the people who run the trolley to actually take care of it. So that's the, the 101 on, on Sandag. Um, so one of the things that, is, that, that we have been working on at Sandag is preparing a new transportation vision for the San Diego region and something that will serve generations to come. It's a legal requirement that we prepare a regional plan that looks out to the year 2050 and beyond and that we update it every four years. We are super lucky in this region to have institutions like Scripps and some of the other collaboratives available to us because it really allows us to do better planning than I would like to say that is done anywhere else in the state of California. We're one county, we're one region, and we're incredibly um, fortunate to have the resources we have to do the planning here. So the um, vision has actually turned into a plan. It's um, an expensive plan. And so when we say there's no time to waste, this is a region I believe that is worth investing in. So in order to make change, to provide true travel options, and transportation is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. If we're gonna address the climate, we've got to give people transportation options that are clean, where we're riding more together, and we're focusing our growth and development so that we're not continuing to sprawl. So those are some of the key elements. This vision is, it's visionary. We're talking about a whole new transportation system that builds on what we have, but makes it work better. And we're really solving for these key things. People are sick and tired of sitting around in traffic, so we have to address traffic congestion. We need to do that in a way that addresses social equity. Transportation has probably been one of the biggest contributors to dividing communities. When Interstate 5 was built, it divided Barrio Logan from Logan Heights. It created this huge area for emissions, for terrible air quality. We've got people sitting at the border for hours and delay down there. That all contributes to poor air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. And that some of our, our poorest communities suffer the most from that. Also, if people don't have access to good transportation, how do they get to education for a better life? Transportation is a key in order for all of us to be able to benefit in what this region has to offer. And finally, the third part of this is meeting our state and federal mandates. And there are very strict state and federal mandates that our plan has to meet to show how we are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the bar continues to rise. And so that was the other reason we took this more um, visionary approach to putting together a regional plan. For the first time, we had more data than we've ever had before. And for you know, decades, we've been preparing these plans every four years. And for the most part, we've had the same list of transportation projects in that plan. We kind of do a refresh on the cost estimates, how much we think we're gonna grow, where we think we're gonna grow, um, put a nice new cover on the plan, follow all the laws and turn it in. This time we said, forget anything we have assumed in the past, let's start from scratch and let's use all the latest data. What do we know about where people are traveling around the region? For the first time, we actually had the cell phone data to use to see where people are going. Where a lot of people are making the same trips during the same time of day, those are the best options for high-speed transit. We see a lot of shorter trips. Those are opportunities for us to do more ride sharing. Those are opportunities for us to think about neighborhood electric vehicles that help us get around for some of the shorter trips and we can share some of those rides. We start with the basics. Where do people live in the region? So the first figure on the far left that has the pink, the darker, the, the darker the area, the higher intensity of population in that area. 
The figure in the center shows where our employment centers are. And what's interesting and what makes this a planning challenge is not everybody works in downtown San Diego. In fact, the largest job center in the region is up here in Sorrento Valley. People are working in downtown, in Kearney Mesa, and, and also up in North County. And so how we make sure that we are connecting these employment centers where where people live and work is super duper important. How does this all come together in the plan? So we took the data and we applied what we call five big moves, five big strategies to put a plan together. Have any of you heard of the regional plan and the five big moves? Just the front row? Okay, good. <laughs> By the time we're done, all of you will know about it. So that's good. Okay, so we took the data, put everything off the table that we had ever thought of before and put these strategies together. So the first thing, look at the region and let's focus our growth and development in the existing areas. This is tough. This means that, you know, we're going to have closer neighbors. But we have to focus our growth and development in the western third of the region because if we continue to sprawl, we're creating more opportunities for fire hazard. People are long, driving longer distances and that all contributes to climate issues. So starting with what we call the mobility hubs, the land uses is focusing our housing and jobs in existing areas. We call these the mobility hubs. Layer on top of that, the second big move we call flexible fleets. So this is actually deploying shared vehicles kind of based on the Uber and Lyft model. Um, if any of you have been downtown, there's something called FRED, which is free ride everywhere downtown. So it goes within about a three mile radius and that is all sponsored by downtown businesses. So you can use your phone, you, you call Fred, Fred comes and gets you. You may have a couple of other people in the vehicle, but they take you where you need to go if you wanted to go to lunch or a doctor's appointment or something nearby within about a three mile radius. So that concept, deploying that in our densest urban areas, and it can also help us get to um, higher uh, to transit stops where we have a better transit connection. The next layer is what we are calling the um, our complete corridor. So really rethinking how we use our highway system. And if you've ever been on the on Interstate 15, the managed lanes that run through there, buses go free, carpools go free, and people can pay to use the lanes as long as they're not congested. And then that funding comes back in to make the transit less expensive. So then that starts to become an incentive. So deploying that on all of the freeways throughout the region, and that does not mean widening the freeways, means taking the freeways that we have and repurposing existing lanes, taking advantage of the shoulder so all that works better. So this is really reinvesting in a multi, probably trillion dollar investment that has already been made in transportation infrastructure, but really doing that with an eye toward climate and equity. The next level is a bus, a, a very robust rapid bus network. So if any of you are familiar with the Superloop, which is um, one of the, the rapid buses that moves around this area, it's taking that to the next level where there are actually dedicated lanes for the buses so that you would actually choose to take the bus because it's quicker, it's more convenient. Next is really improving the trolley so that it's faster. Right now, if you're going from the border at San Ysidro to downtown San Diego, it takes an hour. Part of that is because the trolley sits in the same traffic with vehicles. So just by doing what we call grade separations, so if you can take the trolley and make it above or below the roadway, just at certain intersections, we can get people into downtown in 20 minutes. So that 20 minutes, and then if you add it's 25 minutes to get up to UCSD, that is a doable trip and it's far faster than if you were gonna drive your own car. That's where we start to provide compelling options. That is the fourth big move, which is known as flexible fleets. And then on top of that, we make um, actually a new investment in high-speed commuter rail. So that's the dark purple shown here. So that would be a new commuter rail, most likely a subway that would hit from the border to our major job centers into Sereno Valley and then connects back in with Oceanside. As we're making these improvements, really speeding up what we call the low sand corridor, so the coaster and Amtrak, there's a lot that we can do there to make that faster as well. This kind of service is like 80, 90, 100 miles an hour. Again, this starts to become a compelling reason to not have to drive your own vehicle. And I think one of the most 
um, exciting uh, presentations I did was with Dr. Merrifield, who's here at, um, or at one of the climate scientists, if some of you know him. And we were presenting with a, a committee of the state assembly who was interested in climate and economics. And they said, Dr. Merrifield, just tell us as a climate scientist, what is the most important thing that we could do to make a difference? And he said, it's the Sandag plan and the five big moves. So that made me feel like, wow, okay, I finally made it as a planner. Climate scientists said that what I was putting forth made a lot of sense. We already talked about mitigation and adaptation, but that, that's what this whole plan is about. Mitigating, adapting, and really finding that sweet spot between the two. A key thing as we are able to focus our growth and development in those mobility hub areas that I showed you, we can preserve our open space. We preserve that open space, that helps with carbon sequestration. We take care of the habitat so that it's the natural habitat. That helps us deal with the extreme heat and also helps us make sure that you know, we're reducing opportunities for fire. So that's key. Maybe some of you have seen this in the news. <laughs> yeah, it's getting scary out there. So um, one of our major rail corridor in this region, this is the busiest rail corridor on the West Coast, San Diego to Los Angeles, known as the Low Sand Corridor. It's not only important to passenger vehicles, this is a major freight corridor, and it's also how the military gets military equipment up and down the corridor from Camp Pendleton down to the major naval bases. So critical, critical infrastructure, and it's in extreme danger from water above and the waves below. Maybe you've seen in the news, we are extremely fortunate that our state assembly members and senators have worked really hard. We got $300 million in the state budget to get this fixed. And that means taking the train off the tracks and getting it in a tunnel. When we do that, we can speed this up. And meanwhile, we're working on shoring up these bluffs so that we have that safety in place because it's going to take us about eight to 10 years to get the new infrastructure built. So that's just another example of where we see the climate <laughs> change impacts right there and creating an actually dangerous situation. Other things that we're doing, um, so on State Route 67, which is back in, one of the, in some of the rural areas, hopefully most of you are familiar with that area, um, we have to be really careful, and, and Kerry actually brought this up in, in his part, we have 17 tribal nations in the, in the region. They're also communities that we have to be concerned about, but how they get to and from the reservations to get to goods and services, if we make the roadways wider and accommodate more traffic, then we create that, that invitation for sprawling development. So instead, how do we put some safety measures in so we make sure that we've got strong evacuation routes we also look at how we can deploy technology so that we can better utilize the roadway that we have there. So having real-time information about traffic and different times to travel so people are traveling at less congested time periods. That all goes in here. The other thing that we're doing is dig once. So there's some funding in here to, to fix the surface and, and, the, and the safety, but also we're putting fiber in because we found out during the pandemic, and I think all of us know this, how many kids got left out of education, especially in our rural areas, because they did not have access to high-speed internet. So again, it's tackling through all of this, and as we deploy technology, making sure that we have real-time information available, it's putting in the fiber so that we can take advantage of the latest, um, what we call the operating system, to make this whole transportation plan work together. We've talked about what all these different impacts are, what happens with temperature and water and sea level rise and how this impacts the overall environment. One of the things I wanna invite you all to do is stay engaged with Sandag, inform your neighbors. This is the opportunity for us to build some very important infrastructure that will make a difference for everyone in the region today and for generations to come. And with that, I would like to leave you with this video. Where to? Let us show you. To the 10,000 connections that bring San Diego together. To the people and the places that make this region like nowhere else. These connections get us to our jobs. To the homes we live in and the neighborhoods we visit. 
But they're much more than that. They're part of a bigger plan. A transportation plan that gives San Diego more options. More access and more ways to be together. <laughs> what's more is that we're not starting from scratch. We're taking what's already working and making it better. With big moves towards new technology, the future is in reach. So how do we do it? With big dreams, smart moves, and by including everyone. It's a plan that will drive us and move us. But most of all, it will connect us. Thank you very much. So I live in San Marcos, and I see a lot of emphasis on um, building out and up the coast. But what are you doing to expand up the 15 corridor so that people like me can go and take um, a fast rapid transit downtown and not take my, and I happen to have an electric car, but I'd still rather take public transportation. The other thing to note is that a lot of people are moving further out because they can't afford to buy around the work centers until we fix the housing costs. All of this is wonderful, but it's still not answering that problem. You'll hear? Okay, so excellent points. Um, first of all, um, what the plan calls for, one of the big um, inhibitors to really helping make the I-15 work better is how it connects to State Route 78. So some of you might know. So we need to improve those connections so that transit can run quickly along State Route 78, the bus rapid transit, and also on Interstate 15. So that's a key. Actually, work is underway right now to fix what we call those freeway connectors. So it's the connection from 78 to 15 and also from uh, I-5 to 78 as well. So that is in the plan. The engineering is in the works there. So that's important. Um, the other thing is there is the, the rail, the sprinter. Unless you live in North County, you've probably never seen the sprinter, you've never heard of it, and it's really slow. It goes So part of the plan is to like get rid of some of those curves, do some of the grade separation, really, truly speed that up. But you hit the nail on the head with the housing affordability. Huge issue. What I can say is that the state of California has provided to this region $43 million to start a program. Sandag is putting forward about $60 million, so we'll have close to $100 million. And right now we're talking to developers and the local jurisdictions, how do we use that funding to the best of our ability to start getting some affordable housing built in this region? Part of you know just, just having more, once you have more housing built, you can start to at least deal with the supply aspect that then when, the, when we have more supply, the demand isn't so great and hopefully the prices will come down. But anyway, you're, you're absolutely right. People, what, is, what do we say? You drive to qualify is, is what I have heard as a term in the Bay Area. So it's gonna, part of the cost of housing too is that lots of us don't wanna have neighbors so close by or if we're building condos, how do we, how do we help all of us realize that we're all better off if we can live closer in and accept new neighbors and know that our neighbors are gonna be like us and it's important to have diverse communities and think about that we don't all have to live in a single family home all the time. There's a point in your life where you might need an apartment, then maybe you need a condo, then you live in a house and then after, you know, maybe the family leaves and you're alone or it's just two people, then you can rethink, do you wanna live in a more urban area? And so not always thinking that everyone needs that single family home. So. Lots of education and lots of work to be done, but two outstanding questions. We talked about disadvantaged communities and you know the connection between social equity or and just social justice, environmental justice. In the San Diego region, do you have a sense of like what proportion, whether it's by area or by population, actually qualifies as disadvantaged? And um, the second question is, as we're looking at these compounding impacts of climate change and the time to be acting was yesterday, um, are there dollars that we can put in our local region to help get people's attention about how much of uninsured damage are people gonna, we just gonna have to absorb as we look at not just transportation, but everything becomes increasingly expensive. So two questions, thank you. Yeah, do you want me to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 
So when we talk about disadvantaged communities, they really fall into two categories. So they are populations by Title VI that are considered to be disadvantaged. And then there are low income. When you look at that together, it's more than 50% of the region's residents. So we're talking about a large population. So we can look at it population-wise. Then there's concentrations, certain geographies, where there is a higher, higher population. And, and so I think it's, we, we look at those areas. When it really comes down to it, it, it's low income that we really need to make sure we're absolutely trying to serve so that we make sure we're giving everybody an opportunity for upward mobility. And then do you wanna, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to, I wanna add one thing to that. Um, more specifically to the question as it pertains to climate resilience planning, the law that requires an environmental justice element of the general plan is focused more on the, um, how these communities are affected in terms of health and safety. And so um, the, the law that defines disadvantaged communities that a city is required to evaluate when they do an environmental justice element uh, uses a tool called CalEnviro Screen that the state has put together that actually looks at a lot of different statistics about neighborhoods, uh, their susceptibility to different kinds of environmental uh, hazards that are created uh, by industrial development, those sorts of things. And it's a, a fairly scientific approach to uh, guide the development of an environmental justice element that specifically deals with some of the impacts that um, people that live in older areas, near industrial development, places like Barrio Logan, uh, near the naval uh, yards, uh, as one example, um, how they are affected in terms of the health impacts and the safety impacts. And then the city is required to develop some strategies that um, hopefully over time will make those, uh, reduce those impacts. So um, they're, depending on the planning that's involved, um, there are different definitions, but the one that probably connects closest to climate resilience planning is the, um, it's called Senate Bill 1000, and that's what requires an environmental justice element in every general plan uh, once certain criteria are met. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for your terrific questions and for coming, and look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you.